Well, welcome to session, what is it, 42, Trading Climate Change. Um, and we have three papers to be presented here today. Uh, first paper is going to be presented by Anshi Tresa, The Impact of Trade on Global on Greenhouse Gas Emissions, the Role of Trade and Climate Change Policies. Second paper presented by Eddie Beckers, Comparing Different Approaches to Tackle the Challenges of Global Carbon Pricing. And the third paper is Environmental Goods Trade Liberalization, a Quantitative Model Modeling Study of Trade and Emissions Effects. Mark Paquetta will be presenting that, um, all three WTO folks, including myself for right now. Um, but without uh, further delay, let me ask Anshi to start uh, sharing her screen and to present. Thank you, Anshi. Uh, you have 20 minutes to present, I believe. Uh, no, it looks, yes, 20 minutes and then 10 minutes for questions and um, then these transition periods. But uh, please, Anshi, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bob. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. So we have slightly changed the, the title of, of the, the, the presentation and the paper. It's the, on the impact of trade on emissions, uh, and actually it's carbon emissions, uh, through diffusion of ideas. So this is the main channel that we will be looking at. Um, it's a recent work, so we have preliminary um, results, but um, it would be interesting to discuss um, what we have found until now. So this is a co-authored paper with Eddie Beckers and uh, Jean Metivier. So the, the rapid expansion uh, in the recent uh, decades, there has been a rapid uh, expansion of international trade and an increase of gross output. And uh, of course, uh, the reduction in the trade barriers have played an important role uh, in trading more and in the increase in GDP. Uh, but another issue has popped up uh, in, the recent, uh, in the recent years or decade uh, is the increase of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And um, in a way, uh, trade has has uh, has has a role in, in this. And we would like to know what is the effect of trade on emissions. Now, trade affects emissions through uh, production, consumption, and transportation. And uh, the last component uh, is quite uh, quite discussed and important because uh, as uh, as trade opens and uh, countries can import inputs from uh, from other countries, distant uh, uh, sourcing uh, sourcing countries for the inputs, uh, they also uh, emit more through transportation. So this is, uh, uh, this is let's say, uh, an issue with, uh, with trading in, in distance, uh, distant destination, uh, origins or destinations. But on the other hand, uh, open trade contributes to, to more innovation and it enables uh, the access uh, of new inputs, varieties, the access of foreign technology, knowledge and know-how. This is in general, and uh, in particular here, we would like to know what is the role of uh, diffusion of ideas through trade in reducing emissions. So what is the, the, the role that the trade plays uh, through the diffusion of ideas um, in emissions? So what we do is that we use the, the energy power version of the WGTM uh, model. Uh, which is a recursive dynamic computable general equilibrium model, and uh, we expand it uh, with a diffusion of ideas. So uh, we first uh, built a baseline uh, projection until 2050 uh, for the global economy, which uh, Jean uh, explained uh, in the in the previous session. And uh, this is generated uh, by including different ingredients in order to, to reach net zero. So we an increase in energy efficiency, uh, in the share of renewables, electricity shares, coal phase out, a carbon pricing that we have implemented, etc. So uh, what we do is that for this paper, we take this uh, net zero um, uh, scenario and we use it as our baseline scenario. So we compare the emissions in a cooperation towards net zero indeed a scenario until uh, 2050 with emissions in three different policy scenarios uh, so the first one is the revival of multi uh, multilateralism uh, so trade is largely liberalized 
uh, tariffs are, are largely decreased and also NTMs are reduced by 25%. And here we would like to know when we open up to trade, uh, how emissions are affected uh, in the case where uh, the diffusion of uh, of ideas is uh, is present, and I will explain what is what is the channel, how how we, we model that afterwards. The second scenario is on the coupling of the global economy. So basically, we have three blocks: uh, U.S. and allies, China and allies, and uh, neutral countries. And uh, the the level of tariffs goes uh, goes up, um, and here it uh, uh, goes up to the to a trade war level, and uh, NTMs also increase. Now, the third scenario, which uh, we also find the more interesting one to, to look at, uh, is the reduction of trade costs, but in sectors that are uh, selling inputs to wind and solar, so to renewable sectors. Uh, and this, these two sectors are sophisticated uh, manufacturing and other services. Uh, so we reduce tariffs, uh, we liberalize trade uh, specifically in, this, in these sectors and look at how emissions uh, are affected. Then in the fourth scenario, which is actually a, a beta version of the third one, uh, what we do is that we increase, we uh, use exactly the same scenario, but we increase the strength of diffusion of ideas, which is uh, the beta parameter, and it goes from uh, 03 to, uh, to, to 0 0.6. So we decompose the, the impact of trade on CO2 emissions into three different channels. The first one is the scale effect. Uh, this is similar to what has been done also in the literature, for instance, uh, by Shapiro. Uh, so the scale effect consists in the expansion of economic activity. So we have more emissions because we produce more. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we would expect that trade increases emissions, has a positive effect on emissions. The second one is the composition effect. And when we talk about the composition effect, uh, we refer to a change in the production mix, which can actually be negative or positive. And this depends on the, on the comparative advantage that the country has. So we would expect that uh, through open trade and this diffusion of ideas channel, some countries would specialize in clean technologies. So we, we in sectors, so there is this composition effect that is bias, let's say, towards clean sectors, and um, and uh, some countries might specialize in, in dirtier ones. Uh, so uh, again, for the composition effect, we might have an ambiguous, um, uh, ambiguous result depending on, on, um, on the countries that are specializing to clean or dirty sectors. And the third is the technique effect, which consists in the changes in the technique of production, uh, for example, through changes in the mix of energy inputs that are being used uh, uh, by uh, the energy inputs uh, in general or the, the inputs uh, of electricity, for instance, through the diffusion of ideas as a, as a result of trade. So again, I point out that, uh, that the results are quite uh, preliminary. Uh, in the baseline, we find that uh, from 2021 to 2050, uh, when we have diffusion of, uh, of ideas uh, through trades, uh, through importing inputs uh, from other countries, uh, the technique and composition effect more than compensate for the scale effect. So the overall uh, effect on emissions um, um, is uh, is negative in the sense that trade reduces emissions, um, and again I'm repeating that the baseline here is uh, our scenario towards reaching uh, net zero. Uh, the second finding is that the role of transportation emissions is positive but small, which in a way confirms earlier work, but we still have to to do a little bit more work in this point. Uh, and the third is that there is, a, uh, there is only a marginal role of trade liberalization in the diffusion of green technologies uh, for, the, for at least the trade liberalization scenarios that we have evaluated uh, in this work. Now, uh, this, uh, th this paper is related to different strands of literature. The first one is uh, that uh, trade helps in innovation and diffusion of ideas. And as a result, uh, there, are, there is more incentive to, to invest in R&D. Uh, this induces higher profits. Um, also, firms are able to expand their, their market uh, access. 
um, and uh, have like positive demand shocks from the export, uh, the export, the the, the, destina the destinations, um, and uh, most importantly, diffusion of of, uh, of more productive ideas through trade will boost productivity growth. So this would bring uh, would bring uh, growth uh, to to different countries. Uh, the second strand is the diffusion of green technologies in particular, and there is um, there is some uh, quite some empirical analysis that has been done in this respect using some green patents and showing how uh, the, the number of green patents or the access to green patents through, through trade um, would induce a reduction in emissions. Again, the results are depend on the type of emissions that are considered in the different uh, in the in the in the different studies. So sometimes the results are ambiguous. Sometimes there is like some positive uh, effect in the reduction of emissions. Uh, then trade helps with cost sharing of green technologies. Uh, naturally, we will think about GVCs in the chain of production. Uh, all the firms that are uh, that belong to the same chain of production would benefit from uh, the, the the fixed cost that might have already been paid uh, by uh, one. Uh, one uh, firm that belongs to that chain of production and through trade, green technologies would diffuse. Uh, and lastly, and uh, and importantly, it's uh, the effect of trade on emissions that has been uh, that has been studied in particular by taking into, into account transportation emissions by uh, Christian co-authors and uh, Shapiro 2016 and then the handbook book chapter uh, 2021. So this is uh, what we will more or less we are inspired by by this last works in order to see how trade affects emissions by considering this baseline that that is the net reaching net zero in 2050, but uh, adding this ingredient uh, that is the, the diffusion of ideas. So we use, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, the GTM model um, at the WTO, the GTAP 10 database. Uh, we aggregate, uh, we have uh, 12 regions and uh, 20 sectors. Uh, the baseline is the net zero, um, and we include a diffusion of ideas module. So the way uh, this is done is uh, that uh, in a way, so the beta parameter, if we take the, the Eton Cortum technology parameter, uh, it is linked uh, to a beta parameter that is the strength of diffusion. So uh, if uh, if uh, delta lambda here, the difference in, uh, in, uh, in the productivity in the destination country, uh, in the destination sector, it depends on the on the the imports of uh, of of the uh, in the productivity of the source countries that are trade weighted, but also on these beta parameters that is the strength of diffusion. So in other words, if beta, for instance, is equal to zero, then uh, the destination country would not benefit at all from the technology of the source country. So this is the way that the diffusion of ideas is uh, is modeled through, through trade, so through, uh, through trading intermediates. Then the decomposition of emissions uh, is the scale, um, the scale effect. So basically, this is uh, uh, the, the the change in the gross output. So it's the share of uh, the gross outputs uh, from 2021 to. Uh, um, uh, so it's the change uh, in gross uh, in total gross output until 2050. So we multiply by the growth rate in gross output compared to 2021. Then um, the scale composition effect. It's exactly the uh, well. It's the same thing, but by adding the emission intensity and keeping it constant. So the idea here is that we isolate the technique effect. We don't have any emission intensity changes, but because of a composition effect between the different sectors, so between the gross output that is produced in different sectors, we have this composition effect that pops up. Uh, in other words, if we if this growth in uh, gross output is attributed to growth in cleaner technologies, then the composition effect would reduce the emissions uh, that are created in a way by, by the scale effect because we are producing more. And um, the, the emission intensity here, so it's uh, is the sum of uh, the, the emissions that come uh, from firms that are buying uh, fossil fuels. So we have coal, gas, and oil. This is, this is our sources of where emissions come from, it's from this sector 
sectors uh, when they are buying to the domestic sector, uh, domestic economy, uh, or imported, uh, plus uh, the emissions that uh, come from consumers. So when they are buying fossil fuels domestically or uh, or uh, foreign ones. And then uh, we have all the effects, so the scale composition and technique effect, which is uh, basically the difference in the total emissions uh, from uh, the 2050 to, uh, to, the, to 2021. So uh, I will present the first results that we have. So this is the results with the baseline with diffusion of ideas. So here we don't um, uh, we don't interfere with any trade policy. We don't have any scenario or trade liberalization uh, scenario. Uh, we just compare uh, the baseline uh, between 2021 and 2050, and what will what we find here is that indeed the scale effect tends to increase emissions in general. So when we look at the red dots, uh, they are on the right. So compared to the baseline in 2050, uh, the scale effect uh, increases emissions. But uh, we see that uh, when we add the composition effect, it goes uh, much uh, more on the left. And then with the technique effect, as we can see, there are uh, many dots in different countries that uh, are mostly developed, I would say, but not all, um, that uh, reduce emissions. Actually, the, the, the sum of the three effects uh, tends to bring emissions lower. I would not, yeah, we cannot pretend that it's for all regions, but uh, but in general, it, it uh, tends to decrease uh, to decrease emissions. So uh, then uh, we would like to present the results about the third scenario uh, where we liberalize trade only selling sectors of renewables. And uh, we look here specifically in transportation sector uh, because uh, we wanted to, to look at how transportation, what is the role of transportation emissions in, uh, in trade. And actually uh, what we find until now is that transportation uh, uh, increases emissions uh, and that the role of diffusion of ideas uh, in this scenario until now does not, um, does not have, let's say, a, an impact. Uh, then we look at liberalizing uh, trade and selling sectors of renewables in uh, in other sectors other than uh, other than um, than transportation, and we find that the scale and composition effects are positive in some some regions. Uh, so they are expanding production and uh, shifting towards uh, dirtier industries, and this is the composition effect that uh, that that is present. So here, for instance, in this case is uh, for the rest of the world in uh, Asia, we see that the scale is on the left and then the composition goes, uh, brings emissions to the right. And this is probably because of this, this specialization in, in dirtier sectors, as it is negative in other regions where uh, it's shrinking production and shift, we see a shift towards uh, cleaner industries. Actually, you have about five minutes, about five minutes. Thanks. What uh, what we have also tried to do is to increase the, the strength of diffusion. So we bring uh, beta from 0, 0.3, we double it to 0, 0.6, and we find that the, the effect uh, for now, it's not it's not very strong, but uh, uh, it's it's a little bit stronger. I, I mean, the, 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 the reduction emissions, uh, it's... Uh, there are less emissions, let's say, with a higher diffusion uh, of ideas parameter, but uh, but the the change is very very it's it's um, small. So then we were thinking about what is going on and why what, what's uh, what lies behind behind the 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 let's say the the small effect of diffusion of ideas and we looked at the share of renewables in different scenarios and we can see that indeed the the share of renewables it increases in different uh, from the base uh, to the to 2050 uh, and then it increases also with the strength uh, with the with the strength of diffusion though the increase is small but if we compare this to scenarios, so column two and uh, and four with the results, uh, we can see that uh, the, the increase uh, in general when beta is 0, 0.6 uh, is more important, so the increase in the share of renewables. So I will conclude now. Uh, we have found that there is a marginal role of trade liberalization and diffusion of green technologies uh, for, for the scenarios that we have evaluated here. Uh, 
there is a shift in use of inputs to produce electricity towards um, renewables that is not interacting for now with trade liberalization. Um, the role of transportation is there, is small. Uh, and um, in the baseline scenario, we still see that the technique and composition effect more than compensate uh, for the for the scale effect to reduce global emissions. Now we have a, a to do list for for the next steps. Uh, we would like to analyze other trade policy experiments to identify when trade plays a beneficial role in diffusion uh, diffusion of green technologies. So ideally, it would be interesting to use like an MRIO uh, version of the of the model in order to control for tariffs in the absorbing sectors. Uh, then the idea would be also to split transportation sector per country in order to uh, distinguish between trans international trans transportation and domestic transportation and to be able to see what, uh, what is truly coming from, inter what part of emissions are coming from international transportation. Uh, and finally, take into account the emission intensity per bilateral route. So ideally, in Shapiro and, Christ and Christian Cothers, they look at uh, the emission intensity in one year. So they compute it for one year. And ideally, we would, we would uh, compute it for, for continuous years. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. Um... So let me open this up and see if I can get a broader view. Uh, I see one hand, Dominic, you have a question. I do actually, I, I really liked the, the talk and the presentation and, and the approach. Yeah, I, I guess the idea I had is how are ideas generated? Um, so in, is there a cost to generating ideas? Because I understand the diffusion model, that's kind of free, right? you're importing this knowledge and it costs you nothing except the price of the imports, but the source country must be generating the ideas and that presumably there's a cost to that. Any reactions to that question? So yeah, the, the, the diffusion of ideas basically here, it just comes from, uh, I will just go back to the, to the equation and basically uh, it depends yeah it depends on the on the on the productivity of the sourcing countries and as the share of intermediates is related i mean uh, the diffusion of ideas travels through the 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 inputs that are the intermediate goods that are being bought so this is this is the idea of of how it's embedded um, it's embedded and yeah, i exactly. think what dominic may be asking is there additional costs such as licensing IP kinds of things. Is that right, Dominique, or some other aspect? Uh, cost yeah, of R&D? So, um, so I, I mean, you might want to check the Envisage documentation. We actually have uh, expenditures in R&D. Uh, so you, you, you buy knowledge, basically, and you have a stock of knowledge. You can depreciate. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's an actual cost to that, to, 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 uh, to, to building up that knowledge. It only impacts uh, a share of TFP. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't let TFP be completely defined by this. And we we quasi calibrate it. It's not not ideal. It gives us plausible numbers. Um, the other thing is that the, um, the the dollar you invest today has has a, has a payoff only in the future, right? And so we have these kind of lagged lagged uh, mm -hmm. uh, equations. So it may take, you know, in agriculture, it may take 40 to 50 years before you actually get the payoff from your R&D. Take a look at the Envisage documentation. Mm -hmm. I, think that's a, a, <laughs> I think that's a different aspect and an important one. I, I think the question being asked here is for knowledge that's already being generated, not, exactly. not, not additional knowledge that might be spurred uh, by investments in climate change technology or government policy to do that. In which case, I think you'd want to look at the cost benefit analysis and, and uh, sort of discount the, the rate of return. Eddie put some uh, responses in the chat. I don't know if he wants to weigh in on that or not. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I fully agree with Dominique, like in principle, it shouldn't fall like mana from heaven and there are costs to, to generating innovation. But I'm also with Bob that here, uh, 
probably our focus is more on how technology is diffusing and not so much on on what the costs are of, of, of generating it. There is a, a large literature, and you mentioned, uh, Dominique, uh, the uh, uh, agriculture sector. I mean, I know there have been studies looking at the returns to R&D in agriculture, and it's rather large, even if it takes uh, many years. But um, it uh, certainly those paybacks have been viewed as extraordinary. Uh, at least that's the, the message that the... Uh, Land grant universities like to uh, to market, and I, I I tend to agree with it based on what I've seen. So, um, right, other questions, please, for Anshi and co-authors. I, I think I think it's very important to understand that the drivers of um, well the potential role for this these effects, and and frankly, um, I'm a I'm disappointed, but uh, that there's relatively small um, and uh, that's that's a but that's an interesting finding uh, it means it suggests that there, this may not be a magic bullet um, and that there are other effects that are more important to pay attention to from a policy perspective um, unless there are ways that we can find to increase that beta right um, or looking at uh, uh, the two mechanisms the transfer of of knowledge uh, through the diffusion of inputs, uh, but also then maybe perhaps additional expenditures uh, on new technology that might have bigger effects. Marila, I'll be quiet. Marila has a question, please. Uh, no, just I was curious, uh, since you are disappointed with the results, what were the policy recommendations you were hoping to derive from this analysis? Uh, just yes, for WTO or just broader policy implications at the country level? I'll let Eddie and Anshi take a shot at that. Well, I would say that, uh, like for for now, this is uh, this is still a work in progress. So we are still uh, hoping to to improve our results and and see what uh, comes out of this. But uh, in general, my stand is that probably it's important to have complementarity uh, com uh, to complement with other policies like uh, regulation or subsidies that are directed through like um, yeah to to direct the use of, uh, of, of the, the different uh, yeah, the regulation and the subsidies and could complement this, this diffusion uh, of, of ideas uh, through trade. Then another component that we haven't, uh, uh, we, haven't uh, imp uh, we haven't incorporated here and for instance is, uh, is part of the at Santa Creu paper uh, is the absorptive capacity of the different countries like uh, maybe in green technologies this works differently uh, compared to other technologies that uh, might be used in dirty sectors. And um, this is also another another reason why I think that for now we don't have uh, like an important uh, uh, we don't have an effect of this diffusion of ideas, uh, um, inc the incorporation of this diffusion of ideas through trade, because uh, it might be that uh, the technologies might also, the, the diffusion uh, works also in dirty sectors. And even if we tried with the third scenario to, to control for that in a way by liberalizing only in specific uh, uh, selling sectors to wind and solar, we cannot know that those sectors are not also selling to other sectors that are um, producing emissions. So it might also be like a, a modeling challenge rather than, than a result uh, that, is, uh, that is true and uh, happening. Uh, Um, I, I would also add that I, I think from a, a policy messaging perspective, if, if we found bigger effects, uh, it would make the, uh, in terms of knowledge transfer uh, and technological transfer, that it would uh, make a stronger case for open multilateralism and trade, right? Um, through that channel. I mean, there are other channels that, that, uh, that makes the case. Uh, some of Eddie's other work has shown that um, you know, in terms of uh, overall economic growth, the decoupling and breaking down of the global trading system into say two blocks with limited uh, uh, technological spillovers really uh, slows uh, future growth. Um, and I guess this was taking a shot at looking at what it might mean for climate change. It doesn't seem to have a strong effect, but Eddie's 
online. Uh, I see a slight nod of his head, but I don't know if he agrees with that or not. Do you, Eddie? Yeah, no, I fully agree. So I think we were a bit disappointed that we didn't find stronger, at least for now, we didn't find, we don't find stronger effects from this diffusion of, uh, of, uh, of green technologies, because I think it's very often mentioned in policy circles and intuitively it also makes sense. And I think NG already mentioned like a main concern that we've always been having that if like you have diffusion of green technologies in principle, you should also have diffusion of, of great technologies. So modeling wise, it's, it's, not, so, it's not so easy. Um, so one thing that we've been looking at is this, what, what uh, Mark will speak about it later when it comes to environmental goods, this end use control so that you can liberalize tariffs uh, depending on the, on the sector that is buying the goods. I know that Enchi is, is a bit skeptical about whether this, this is implementable in, in practice, but then it, it has been mentioned in the literature. And so that is a thing that we haven't looked at yet. But then so far, the results seem, seem to indicate that, yeah, I mean, this um, with, so now we did this trade liberalization of, of the, the intermediates that are bought most by wind and solar, so sophisticated and, and other services. And it doesn't really seem to lead to a to a shift in in the use towards more renewables in in producing electricity away from from using fossil fuels and um, yeah it, it seems to be that the, probably the the impact that the size maybe the size of the tariffs is also just relatively small so that it it just has relatively it just has relatively little impact. And then the, the scale effects just seem to dominate because if you liberalize, you also you expand production, uh, let alone let alone transportation. Um. Okay, thanks, Eddie. Um, any other questions before we move to the next presentation? Um, I'm sorry if you hear the helicopters in the background, but uh, we have uh, our ministerial conference coming up, and I think. Uh, uh, security forces are practicing out there or something. I don't know. Either that or it's ministers uh, flying in uh, to be dropped off at the WTO helipad, which is uh, doesn't exist, but wouldn't that be cool if it did? All right, Eddie, I think you're up next. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Bob. Let me share my screen. So I, I think, uh, so I'm going to present the uh, work joined with um, with, uh, with Gianmarco Cariola, who used to be with us. And um, he is now um, uh, with the Bank of Italy, uh, unfortunately. But uh, nevertheless, I'll, I'll present this, I think, uh, somewhat pretty interesting work. Some of you might have seen it in a, in a workshop that was organized by uh, by different international organizations, but looking at the audience, I, I think there are quite a couple of people who haven't seen this. So what we're looking at is, is carbon pricing and in particular the challenges of global carbon pricing. And we're gonna compare different ways to, um, to bring us a little closer to, uh, to making global carbon pricing possible. Yeah, and the introduction, the background, I, I guess we're all familiar with that. We have the global warming. We know that climate change mitigation is, is a common pool problem. Um, carbon pricing, this is very diplomatically formulated, but it can be a complement to the, to the more bottom-up Paris approach. Uh, and we have the risk that without a global policy on carbon pricing, that we get a patchwork of policies where countries might start uh, getting into, into trade uh, disputes about border adjustment mechanisms. And so in our presentation, we first provide some overview on the what we call the necessity, efficiency and urgency of global carbon pricing. And then we actually move to our main contribution where we compare different ways, different complementary policies to, um, to bring us closer to the introduction of global carbon pricing. And what we do is we look at, we assume that a subset of countries are taking the initiative uh, to, uh, to introduce global carbon pricing. You could say they are a, a carbon pricing club. And the question then is what complementary policies do we need to incentivize other countries to come on board and also introduce carbon pricing? 
And so we look at these incentive effects, but at the same time, we also look at the fairness of the different proposals in terms of uh, impacts on, on global social welfare. And I should already uh, mention up front there, there is a literature that analyzes this kind of questions uh, more formally, looking at Nash equilibria. We, uh, I, th I think uh, an important contribution that we are making is that we compare four different ways to try to incentivize regions to to come to global carbon pricing. Uh, and so we, we abstract from actually going into the question of, of what is an Nash equilibrium and, and whatnot. So that brings me to the related literature. So there are, are five strands of, of related literature. The first one is exactly on this formation of climate coalitions. Uh, then the second is on the role of trade policy in, in formulating in getting to climate coalitions. So then we're with the North House work. Then um, we have literature on carbon funds and what are you going to do with the revenues from carbon pricing and how could you distribute them globally. Then, uh, obviously, if we speak about carbon pricing, we're into the literature on price versus quantity targets. Uh, and finally, we because we look at fairness and the impact on different regions, there is also the literature on on the impact of climate change mitigation on developing countries, where, for example, this, I think this paper co-authored by, by Dominique is an important contribution. So how do we proceed? Well, this is familiar now. We have this uh, the, the, the recursive dynamic CG model, which we combined with, with GTA Power. Uh, we aggregate to 24 regions, 25 sectors. Then we here we go out only out until 2030. Uh, because we're looking at basically at coalition formation uh, and the baseline shocks are the usual one, GDP per capita growth, population, energy prices, et, et cetera, et cetera. Then what kind of policy shocks do we look at? We uh, have data uh, that we actually, uh, that, that we that, that were shared with, with us very kindly on, on NDCs. In the meantime, for the other work we have developed, more our own work on, on NDCs, but here we're building on uh, uh, data on NDCs. So we have three NDC scenarios, the initial NDC, the uh, updated NDC, and then NDC2. So there would be targets where we, real, where we stay on the path of two degrees global warming. And then we also look at the IMF carbon price floor proposal. Okay, so let me then uh, get to uh, the results. So let's first uh, set the scene. Uh, so we have this necessity, efficiency, and urgency of global carbon pricing here. I present the necessity. So what do we see? Um, we see in blue if we would do uh, uh, nothing and if we would be on the baseline, then uh, to get on NDC2, we need a certain carbon, or we can realize that with a certain carbon price, but we see that uh, we could realize by and large, the same reduction in emissions with this IMF proposal of the $25, $50, or $75 carbon price, depending on the level of income. What we see, moreover, that's the necessity. We see that if we only go with the NDCI or the NDCU, that we're not going to do sufficient. And on top of that, actually, if only the seven uh, high-income countries would go on a path of NDC2 that we would, would be very far from realizing two degrees, let alone 1.5 degree. Then the efficiency, I think this is also something most in the audience are familiar with. So let me say one sentence about this. What we see at the top is carbon, uh, the, the carbon price under regional global, uh, global carbon pricing and emission trading, and at the bottom, the GDP effects. So what we see is the carbon price with regional carbon pricing has to be higher than with global. Yeah, and that's and actually the GDP, the negative GDP effects are also bigger if we stick to regional carbon pricing. Yeah, and that's very straightforward. That's just because with global carbon pricing, we're gonna reduce emissions there where it, it is most uh, where where it is least costly. Okay, then the urgency, that's maybe a bit trickier, what do we mean with urgency? That is more from a political perspective that if we are not coming to global carbon pricing, we're going to see uh, political pressure to protect competitiveness in regions that are more ambitious uh, and therefore calls for introduction of, of border carbon adjustment, which could in turn uh, trigger, uh, trigger responses and, and lead to all kinds of problems uh, um, uh, here in the house, so to say. And so what we display here is the um, 
uh, the change in output in the emission intensive sectors in the seven ambitious regions if these seven ambitious regions uh, introduce carbon pricing and the other regions would not yeah and what we see is that most of the regions in blue without bca they would lose out in terms of real output in their emission intensive sectors what we see what i think is interesting is that if you introduce bca so if say this climate coalition is introducing a carbon price and they set a, a bca on the other on the other regions that it is actually not uniform uh, in that the 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 the, um, the um, prevention of loss of competitiveness is is not gonna is not gonna occur in all the regions. Yeah, we see in the U.S. it's very nice. There would be a loss of output in in emission intensive uh, with carbon pricing, and then with with a BCA that that would be cancelled out. But we see that in some other regions, actually, uh, general equilibrium effects are gonna kick in. Okay, so then before I come to uh, this incentive problem of global carbon pricing, let's we also looked at this IMF proposal and we evaluated to what extent it's gonna what we call insulate the low income regions from the adverse income effects of uh, of carbon pricing. And uh, I think it's a little bit disappointing. What we find is that so in blue, we have the IMF, the differential carbon price, the carbon price floor. In orange, we have a uniform carbon price where we would realize the same reduction in emissions at the global level. And we see that, for example, ASL is Asia least developed. We see that their negative impact is a bit smaller. We see, for example, for India, also a relatively low income country, the negative effect if we would go from uniform to differential would turn into a positive effect but we see for example in sub-saharan africa sub-saharan africa least developed in sub-saharan africa other countries there's not much of an impact and the question then of course is why and i i think one of the important reasons is that um um well, a lot of these adverse effects, they're also occurring because uh, other countries, say for Sub-Saharan Africa, they would only introduce domestically a, a carbon price of $25. But there are also adverse effects because the rich countries are introducing a, a higher carbon price. Yeah, and therefore, for example, the oil producing countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are not are not going to be positively affected by this or they're going to incur adverse, they're, they're going to face adverse effects. Yeah, and so therefore, this seems to indicate that if you want to insulate the low income countries, that you need to do something more. Yeah, and so let's look at what that something more could be. And, and at the same time, look at the collective action problem of global carbon pricing. Um, so what I put up here is that, um, yeah, there is this incentive to free ride, as we know. Uh, and we have short run welfare losses from climate mitigation, whereas the gains come, come back only later. And so, as I mentioned, what we assume is that there is a coalition of ambitious countries. And then we look at four different policies to incentivize other regions actually to join, to join this carbon pricing club. And what we do when we look at the incentive effects, we look at the real income effects of uh, other regions. So the regions not initially in the, in, the, in the coalition of joining the coalition compared to for example, paying the BCA. Yeah, is it then given that you're, you're faced with BCA or maybe North House tariffs, do you have an incentive to actually to change your policy? Yeah, and so here the overview of the com complementary policies, the first two, I think you're, you're all familiar with it, BCA uh, and North House. North House is the uniform tariff to, to try to incentivize regions to join a carbon club. Then the third proposal is this global carbon incentive. We, we, we read about it with, uh, with uh, Rajan, I think a, a, an economist from the University of Chicago who proposes, but when we went back to the literature, we, we found that actually there is, that these kind of proposals have been made already 10, 15 years before. And so the idea is that you uh, put all the revenues from carbon pricing, you, you put them together in a fund, and then uh, the way Rajan is proposing this, but I think uh, also others have done it like that, um, is that um, the net payment out of the fund the, uh, depends on uh, your emission 
uh, per capita relative to the global average emission per capita. So that means that if you're a relatively low income country, then you're going to receive a net from the, from the fund. Um, and the nice thing of this fund is that it's not only a redistribution uh, mechanism, but in principle, it's also an, an, an incentive device because if you reduce emissions, then relative to the average, um, um, you, you're going you're gonna to be further away from the average and therefore you're going to receive, receive more from the fund. Yeah, so let's, let's have a look in a bit at, at whether this also works in, in practice. Finally, what we, what we did is we said, okay, we could also, we can just go back to the good old emission trading and we could work with what we call more progressive emission targets where the low income countries have hardly any target and the high income countries have the, by far the highest target. So we said 0.5, 1.5 and 7%. And I, I should mention- We have about 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think I'll, I'll, I'll make it in, in that time. So let's look at these incentive effects. The first proposal is, is border carbon adjustment. Uh, by the way, we use this term because uh, in house a, lo a lawyer has explained to me that this is the, the international term and it's, it's not CBAM. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm referring here to BCA. Um, but when we look at the results uh, for BCA, we see that most of the bars are on the negative side. So what do we have in these bars? We have, as I've, I've mentioned two slides before, um, we look here at the change in welfare, sorry, the change in, in real income for countries that are not part of the, of the carbon club, the carbon pricing club, if they would decide to join the carbon pricing club and therefore in this case do not have to pay the BCA anymore. And we do that for uh, three different policy scenarios. So we do that, for example, for the IMF proposal, where the richest seven countries would introduce a carbon price of $75 and the other countries do nothing and therefore face BCA. And alternatively, uh, they would not face BCA anymore if they would introduce the, the differential carbon price. And the same, for example, with NDC, if they would decide to, to join, in this case, emission trading. And what we see is that for most of the in most of the cases, countries do not have an incentive to, to, join, uh, to join the carbon club. If we would use real income as a metric to, to determine incentive. Then North House, from an incentive perspective, it looks much better. I, I guess that is something that is also uh, familiar to many of you, many of you in, uh, in, in the audience. So we see that most of the bars are positive for, uh, for North House. Uh, and our, well, the interpretation is just that this is much more of a, it, it's a much stronger instrument and you're going to be much more adversely affected if you do not join the, the, the carbon pricing club. Then uh, here we were a bit disappointed. So this global carbon in, uh, incentive where you have both a redistribution mechanism and, and an incentive device, um, it doesn't seem to work so well when it comes to uh, the impact on uh, on the, the, the countries that are not in the carbon club, um, we find that they do not really have an incentive to join the carbon club. Um, so the question is, what is what is going on here? And we have been analyzing a bit that um, part of the problem is that we have a moving target here and that we're looking at, so the net payment that countries are receiving um, are payments relative to the average uh, so the, the net payment that a country receives depends on, on, on a country's emission per capita relative to the global average emission per capita. But then if all countries are actually would be, would be joining, um, because that's the experiment we're looking at here, then actually this average emission per capita would, uh, would also go down and therefore uh, basically okay, your emission per capita is, is falling then and therefore you're going to receive more from the fund if you decide to introduce carbon pricing. But if other countries also do that, then relatively you're, you're not going to you're not going to benefit that much. Now, of course, the question then is we could have analyzed also other uh, uh, other scenarios where it is one country at a time that decides to join the club. But in the end, from an energy equilibrium perspective, to have an energy equilibrium, it should also be the case that all, if all countries at once decide to join, that it should also be beneficial for, for countries to, uh, to join the carbon club. And we find here that that does, does not seem to be the case. 
Then finally, we thought, okay, let's change the, let's go back to emission trading, but work with much more progressive emission targets. And we find that in this case, um, um, if we, uh, well, we also have regular where uh, the, the, the lower income countries also have to do less and the high income countries more, but with progressive, it's much more extreme. And we see that for the blue bars, many of the blue bars are actually positive. So many countries in, in this case would have an incentive to actually join uh, a global emission trading. Okay, then, um, I guess, I hope I have still a couple of minutes. Um, so here to wrap up, what we find is that um, progressive emission, trade, uh, emission trading with progressive targets and Nordhaus would perform relatively well as an incentive mechanism. But the question is also, how does this uh, look like when we, when we look at the impact on income and especially uh, the impact on uh, income across different regions and we look at we we define a very simple global welfare function where social welfare is a function of uh, uh, of income times one minus uh, the um, glo global average income times one minus the the income inequality between regions yeah and so if we look at the impact on global average gdp per capita we here we tend to find that the global carbon uh, the global carbon incentive uh, fund is is working pretty well, whereas Nordhaus is, is not working well because, of course, it introduces tariffs, so it creates lots of distortions. GCI works better than also global carbon pricing. The reason is that we are redistributing here money to regions with, with, higher, with higher GDP growth rates and with higher rates of return on capital. Though, then if we look at Atkinson, again, we find, so here, Smaller is better because this is an index of inequality. Uh, we find again that the global carbon incentive would perform best, whereas Nordhaus is actually uh, is performing worse in terms of the impact on inequality. Here we summarize this when it comes to the impact on social welfare, the GCI would do best, the carbon fund, but emission trading is also performing relatively okay. Yes, yeah, so our conclusion from this is that, uh, well, to let me go back here. Our conclusion from this is that if you put the two criteria together, like uh, you, you try to incentivize regions to join a, a carbon club, and at the same time you want to do it in a, in a way in which the, the costs, the burden of uh, carbon pricing is shared somewhat, somewhat equally, where rich countries are taking more of the burden. If we take both criteria into account, it seems to be that progressive emission trading is, is performing best. Yeah, and so to wrap up, we have seen that global carbon pricing is more efficient. It suffers from a, a collective action problem. We've seen that this differential carbon pricing is not sufficient to insulate the low-income countries from adverse effects. And um, we find that both emission trading and Nordhaus are effective as incentive mechanisms. But uh, as we've seen, Nordhaus from a, from a fairness uh, point of view is, is not performing so well. And also when it comes to emission trading, if you look at the literature, and this I think also partially explains why most of the policy discussions now is about a plain carbon tax, like the carbon price floor that the IMF is talking about. Um, there are many arguments that 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 um, point out that uh, negotiating uh, about emissions, about global emission trading, is is pretty complicated. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, so, questions? There must be some questions on this particular uh, presentation. Dominique, please go ahead. I have to ask a question in this session. Um, yeah, I, so I, I've looked at some of these policies in the past. Um, I, I think one stumbling block is often, um, I mean, when you have a emissions trading is, you know, who's going to be collecting a lot of the revenues? And in many cases, it's China. They appear to have very low abatement opportunities. And uh, politically, of course, this is this is a little bit difficult. I, I was wondering if you look kind of at, you know, who uh, who would be collecting the you know the bulk of the revenues, and whether that you know that might be an issue. 
Now, it's not the case for all of your policies, obviously, but some of them it could be, correct? Yeah, I think that's a good point. So we we have we haven't looked at the individual country distribution. So we looked at this uh, this Atkinson inequality index for the different proposals. But yeah, obviously with emission trading, uh, you're going to see that um, countries with the most potential for abatement. Um, yeah, and 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 as you point out, that is probably China, also India, probably uh, they they would collect quite a, a large chunk of the of the revenues. And I, I think that would be different with this with this global carbon carbon incentive approach. But but the problem is that there there we seem to have a moving target, and therefore from an incentive perspective, it's it's also not working so well. What about just giving everybody in the world the same level per capita? Mm. That, that's a, let's say it's a hundred dollars, just for the sake of argument. A hundred dollars will go a long way in a poor country. Won't do much in places like the United States, but it would have a pretty big impact in terms of the progressivity. No? Yes, this is, Alaska, yeah, I, this is the Alaska program. Yeah, yeah, I think. But but the the idea of this global carbon incentive was that it was that that it. Okay, I think there I I didn't stress that point. It's also a payment per capita. But then it was it is multiplied the payment that you receive per capita is multiplied by um, the difference between your emission per capita and the average global average emission per capita, and and that would give an incentive to actually do more basically to do more because you're going to receive more from the fund. But then if all countries at the same time are going to join such a fund, then everybody is is basically like the, the the global average emission capita is is gonna is gonna fall and therefore you're you're not gonna improve that much. So so we've been trying to figure out if there is a way to to not have a moving target, but we we haven't come up with uh, with uh, with uh, with an approach that that could work. Okay, thanks, uh, Sherman. Please, floor is yours. Muted. Um, interesting paper because I like the, the, the idea of I mean the, all the different options you explored. Uh, Karen Thierfelder, Dolphin Go, and Shanta Devaraj and I presented a paper earlier in this two two days ago, in which we simply looked at the the, the EU proposal CBAM, on the one hand, looking at it is uh, just simply a, a, a correction for a distortion. In other words, if you're if, if they're not doing carbon adjustments, you can tax them. And then we also look at Nordhaus. Um, CBAM, we can't get, we got your results. CBAM doesn't do much. It did correct for the quote unfair competition, but it had basically nothing to do with global uh, global carbon. We looked at Nordhaus and just, I think, found like, well, sort of like you did, but the numbers just aren't big enough when you do what he did. So we actually hammered it. I mean, we really did a whopping trade shock to see if we can impose enough damage on the countries to induce them to change. And there, there you can get something. I mean, you do get it, but you sure end up distorting everything around the system. So I think basically the story we're all getting is trade is not large enough trade effects are not large enough to offset the fact that you really want them to do it everywhere domestically. I mean, that's the, that's the problem. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing we found is when you did, we, we looked at just two big holdouts because the really big polluter, polluters are China and the US, both of whom may not take part in the club, right? Uh, so we actually hammered both of them just to see what would happen. And what happens is if you hammer China as a holdout, you do a lot of damage to East and Southeast Asia because that's it, that's, you're, you're hitting its regional trading block. If you hit the US, Mexico and Canada get really hammered. And then they're not going to have an incentive to be in the club. So you, the trade relations in that sense get very complicated very quickly because you really have to look at what happens to the linked countries. And we were just trying to look at the looking for the big numbers here, that, you know, just just that alone. It, your paper is fascinating because I like I like the idea of, of really covering the, a lot of these bases. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks a lot for your your feedback. I, I actually I saw the the presentation also last last Wednesday, and I uh, 
I think you make some some very interesting contributions, especially by looking at, at China and the US. And I, I think on on that trade is actually not big enough. I, I think that's like we looked at the introduction of, of carbon pricing to basically stay on the path in 2030. But of course, the question is like what is going to happen after after 2030? And I think this is a point that also in the in I think by Nordhaus himself has been made already that if you want to get to really large carbon prices, then it's going to be hard to to enforce them from an energy equilibrium perspective with with just with punitive tariffs. Yeah. Okay, so it, uh, it's not a silver bullet, but then I mean it, it could be a way to it could be a way to start. Although when it, when it comes to Nordhaus, it's um, yeah, it's it's a rather complicated conversation also here here in the house. So um, thanks. Well, imagine uh, that. <laughs> I mean, you started to the WTO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have a question from Laurent Cotony. Uh, is is it the case that uniform carbon tax will always be lower than differentiated carbon tax? Oh, this this sounds like um, I I I don't know if there there is theoretical literature on this because this sounds like always would would be like that we 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 should prove it with uh, or we should try to prove it with uh, with a theoretical model. Um, I I think. Yeah, just from economic reasoning, I think it should be the case because with a with a uniform, with a global carbon tax, you're always going to abate there where it, where it is least costly, and therefore, to if you want to realize the same target, then you you necessarily would need a, a lower carbon tax. But um, yeah, I, I would be happy to thanks. hear. Thanks, Eddie. I agree with you. That's what I thought too. But I have done some simulation up until 2050 and around. 2045, I have the, the reverse. And it seems that maybe there's some trade effect or leakages that are too strong. I'm not sure. I need to understand why, but I was just wondering if you if you had some uh, encounter something like this before. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, one comment I'll just make, and it hasn't come up in, in this discussion has been, um, but it did come up in this I.O. Uh, uh, workshop that we put together uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, what's the role of regulatory policies and the approach that many policymakers take um, that they seem to prefer over, you know, cleaner mechanisms from an economist perspective like carbon taxes, uh, carbon pricing? Um, any thoughts on that, Eddie? Yeah, so I, I think on on that, um, I, I think when it comes to like, for example, this carbon price floor proposal or like other proposals to to come to global carbon pricing, I think the idea would be that um, we we would come together and and agree on what the equivalent, uh, what basically the equivalent, or what yeah, what the equivalent reduction is that you generate with a carbon price. So say that like you agree, okay, I like some country has to reduce emissions as if they would introduce a carbon price, but then they can decide themselves to to do it actually not with a carbon price, but to do it with uh, with regu regulatory policies. I, I think that's the direction where the discussion is going. But then of course the, the problem is that we will have to agree on, on the model to use uh, to determine what what is equivalent. Thanks, Sh Sherman. Do you have another question? Your hand no, go back not up. A question, just a quick one on this. On the uh, is carbon pricing optimal? Uh, you're in a second best world. You got a lot of existing distortions going on, and the carbon pricing may be small compared. To, you, it may you may get all kinds of odd offsetting effects in particular countries. For a while, so I don't think you're going to get a clean theorem out of that. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Also, yeah, thanks, thanks, Sherman. Okay, any other questions? Last call for questions on this paper. Seeing none, let us now move to the next paper: Environmental Goods Trade Liberalization: A Quantitative Modeling Study of Trade and Emission Effects, with Mark Paquetta presenting. Mark, the floor is yours. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, indeed. 
Yeah. I just want to uh, now have it in full screen mode. Here we are. Voila, there you go. Okay, uh, so this paper um, has been prepared as part of the same effort as uh, the other ones. Um, it's, uh, it's one of uh, those papers prepared by the WTO to analyze the various dimensions of the, of the link between trade and climate change. Um, and it's, it's really a complement to, to what we've already, uh, what the, the two papers we've already discussed. Uh, it's been drafted by uh, the ERSD team, which is working on the WTO global trade model, like, like the, the, the two other papers. Um, so let me just try to. Center my screen. Okay, so um, trade can lead. Actually, we, we have a, a, a preview of, uh, I'll give you a preview of, of the main results. Uh, we find that uh, the paper finds that trade can lead to more uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, through transport, but that it can also contribute to reducing emissions, which is no surprise. More specifically, uh, trade in environmental goods, uh, which is what we are concentrating upon here, uh, can affect uh, greenhouse gas emissions through um, a number of channels. Um, it, it improves energy efficiency. That could be uh, that's related to the, I mean, it's, it's sort of the technique effect uh, identified by Copeland. Uh, uh, lower import prices of intermediates and capital goods uh, used in renewable uh, can also uh, contribute to a reduction of emissions uh, through a sort of composition effect. Uh, more trade leads to more transport and thus emissions. Uh, that's uh, an adverse effect um, uh, well, that uh, is often termed the scale effect. Um, it's not exactly, well, not measured necessarily exactly uh, like that in the model, in, in the paper. But uh, the next one is a, a promotion of green innovation as a consequence of, uh, of trade. We have been discussing this uh, uh, with, uh, with the paper, the previous paper by Engshi that Engshi presented. Um, a shift in consumption to goods with lower emissions in production and consum consumption would also contribute to a reduction in emissions, and that would be another uh, different composition effect. Uh, in, in, in our research, we combine uh, econometric estimation with simulation modeling to explore the, only the first three channels, uh, and we project that trade liberalization of environmental goods uh, will uh, or does actually raise exports of environmental goods uh, in most regions, that it raises GDP in all regions, and reduces global emissions by uh, about 0.6%. Uh, uh, a key question uh, when you uh, consider the effect of liberalizing trade in environmental goods uh, is how you define environmental goods, uh, and more, more importantly, or more precisely, uh, which specific products you include in your list of uh, environmental goods. Uh, because of difficulties to, to clearly define environmental goods and varying trade interests in negotiations, uh, various lists of products have, uh, have been proposed in, in, in conversations, in negotiations uh, on trade liberalization of environmental goods. Uh, we list a number here uh, that are uh, either WTO uh, related or uh, uh, for one is the, the APEC list, uh, uh, the last one here. Um, uh, others were prepared in, in, the, in the context of the Doha uh, agenda negotiations. Uh, but uh, uh, we uh, just to explain the complexity and, and the issues associated with, with the sort of establishing such a list, we haven't been able uh, or allowed to use the, 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 the WTO list just because it's too it's considered to be too sensitive. So we've been uh, even in the World Trade Report that will be issued soon, uh, we uh, uh, were not allowed to use the, the, the existing list, uh, the, w, the so called WTO list. Um, so, in terms of uh, uh, 
background, definition, we uh, usually refer to, or in our minds at least, we, we, refer, we refer to the, uh, the definition by the OECD, uh, which is that environmental goods and services are used to measure, prevent, limit, minimize, or correct environmental damage to uh, water, air, and soil, as well as problems related to waste, noise, and ecosystems. So it's a broad definition. Uh, but in the study, we distinguish between two types. So we take into account, we have, we consider two sets of uh, environmental uh, products. One is uh, the so-called environmentally preferable products, the EPPs, uh, which are products that are inherently more environmentally friendly in their produ production use and disposal. That's, uh, that's a list that's been established by UNCTAD. Uh, and we uh, also use a, a different list that was uh, uh, basically uh, uh, put together for, for this study, for analytical and research purposes, which uh, uh, is a list of, uh, of uh, a subset of uh, goods for environmental management. Uh, and more specifically, the ones we use are the first three here, uh, uh, the, the, which we call energy-related environmental goods. Uh, this, the clean and renewable energy goods, the, the energy efficiency goods, and the resource efficiency goods. But I mean, this category of goods for environmental management uh, that uh, figures in the OECD list is, is, is quite a bit broader. Um, coming to the, to the um, uh, uh, related literature, we uh, just just I, I possibly because of difficulties in defining a list of products, may, maybe for other reasons, there haven't been so many uh, empirical studies on the effects of liberalizing trade in environmental goods. I just mentioned uh, uh, three studies here, one or a, a few more in the, the work by Zubravu, um, which estimate who estimates the impact of environmental goods uh, trade on emission on environmental goods trade on emissions and regulations uh, using an, uh, an instrumental variable. Uh, approach uh, the work by Tamini and Sorgo, uh, who are interested in the trade effects of reducing barriers on environmental, go environmental goods and use a, a gravity model and find a small effect on, on, on emissions. And lastly, simulation work using a, an energy model by Hu et al for the, for the EC. Uh, they uh, they study the effects of environmental good, goods trade liberalization and find that it lowers the cost of producing or, or uh, true the, the, the effects it has on, on the cost of producing renewables. Um, uh, and uh, just mentioned, because I, I will come back to this uh, 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 at the end of the presentation, they use a partial equilibrium actually to trade model to, to obtain cost reductions. Next, um, let me say now explain now the the methodology that's been used in the in the paper. Uh, so uh, the paper uh, employs an energy the energy version of the WTO global trade model, like previous uh, papers. Uh, to, to project uh, trade income and emission effects of potential trade liberalization of environmental goods. Um, we consider the reductions in both uh, tariffs and NTMs uh, on both uh, and, uh, uh, energy related environmental goods and <laughs> environmental, environmental, uh, uh, environmentally preferable products. I'm um, sorry, it's, 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 uh, those acronyms are sometimes a bit difficult to keep in, the, uh, in mind. Uh, so CO2 emissions are um, affected along three channels in, in, the, in, the, in the simulations. Uh, first, uh, an increased imports of uh, uh, resource efficiency and energy efficiency goods raises uh, the energy efficiency in production. Um, and uh, consumption, reducing consumption of energy and, and, and emissions. Uh, that's the technique effect. Uh, increased imports of uh, the, the, the clean and renewable energy goods reduce the cost to produce renewable energy goods, uh, leading to a substitution from the use of fossil fuels to renewable energy uh, in electricity generation, reducing emissions, and that's a composition effect. And lastly, um, trade liberalization of uh, uh, energy-related environmental goods and EPPs raises trade and income, uh, thus increasing uh, demand for energy and emissions, uh, which is the, 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 the scale effect, which is an increase in, uh, corresponds to an increase in emissions. And this channel actually emerges endogenously uh, in the model. Uh, 
Um, uh, let me now uh, uh, underline that modeling emissions, uh, emission effects of uh, uh, environmentally preferable products would require data that we do not have, emission data on consumption, disposal, and production at a detailed product level, uh, and therefore we are not modeling uh, the, those, uh, the effects of uh, EPP liberalization on, on emissions. Okay, next. Uh, so we um, aggregate the GTA Power database 2014 uh, to 24 regions and 24 sectors, and uh, as uh, as in the in the version more model used by by in, in, in the paper presented by Eddie, and we use SplitCom to split uh, split up eregs and EPPs. Uh, trade values and tariffs on EREGs and EPPs are taken from the uh, market access map, the MacMap database uh, provided by the ITC. Uh, we work with a list of 177 HS6 uh, tariff lines representing trade in uh, EREGs uh, that has been prepared by the Secretariat for uh, analytical and research purposes. Um, the uh, uh, EPP uh, HS lines uh, are taken from the paper by Totova. Uh, ad valorem equivalence uh, of non-tariff measures are from CADO. Uh, they are based on uh, uh, account data, on NTMs uh, from the Unta Trains database. Uh, we assume a 25% reduction in iceberg trade costs that's associated with the, that are associated with NTMs. Uh, that's because uh, many NTMs serve domestic policy objectives and can thus not be reduced to, to zero or just eliminated. Um, calibration of the technique and composition effects. Uh, with regard to the technique effect, uh, energy efficiency, efficiency is endogenized as a function of the output price of EREGs which are in turn a function of the price of importing such goods, uh, the elasticity of energy efficiency with respect to the price of uh, 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 energy-related environmental goods is calibrated based on comparing country-specific econometric estimates of the impact of uh, uh, EE and RE trade on uh, CO2 emissions with the simulated impact of uh, this trade on CO2 emissions. Uh, with regard to the composition effect, uh, the costs of producing renewable energy uh, is affected by the import price of CRE goods, uh, clean and renewable energy goods, uh, through the price of intermediates using production and through the price of capital goods. However, since the link between investment and capital is not sector specific uh, in our model, uh, the capital goods price channel is modeled through a productivity shock, uh, which is calibrated based on the price reduction because uh, of the liberalization of uh, uh, energy related environmental goods. With uh, end use control, only the productivity, because we have uh, both a, 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 a scenario with and one without end use control. Uh, with end use control, only the productivity of any renewable energy sources of electricity is affected. Uh, Mark, you have about 10 minutes. Okay, four uh, cumulative trade liberalization scenarios are considered. Um, the elimination of tariffs on air eggs uh, is the first one. Uh, that plus 25% uh, reduction in NTMs on air eggs is the second. Uh, then we add the elimination of tariffs on the additional uh, uh, environmentally preferable products. And lastly, we add 25% uh, reduction of NTMs on the, on the additional uh, EVPs. Uh, descriptive statistics on trade in EREGs and EPPs show that, uh, first, uh, the comparative advantage in uh, EREGs uh, is uh, concentrated in Asia. Um, so RCA will reveal comparative advantages in this column. And we see that uh, China, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Mexico too, uh, but Southeast Asia have uh, a strong comp uh, a comparative advantage in um, 
in uh, Eregs. Uh, we saw we see that low-income regions such as, uh, 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 for instance, uh, uh, Asia's, uh, Asian uh, LDCs. Uh, have a uh, have a very low uh, sorry uh, have a very low uh, here have a very low um, RCA uh, on eregs uh, and uh, others for instance would be uh, uh, as uh, this is uh, sub-Saharan LDCs or sub-Saharan other countries um, but those countries actually or most low-income regions have a relatively high RCA uh, in EPPs. And uh, so uh, that's what you see when you look at, uh, for instance, Asia LDCs, they have 2.75 here, uh, or uh, the same as before. Uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa also has a relatively uh, high um, uh, RC. Uh, now turning to uh, initial tariffs and, and NTMs. Uh, we see that uh, in, in, the, in this table, we see that uh, developed economies impose uh, the lowest average import tariff on uh, uh, EREGs, uh, uh, followed by developing uh, and, and least developed uh, economies. Um, that's on the, 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 uh, the tariff they impose on, on their imports. Uh, on the exporter side, least developed countries would face the smallest reductions, uh, reduction in tariffs uh, here uh, related to uh, because of the existence of, of, of preferences. Turning now to, uh, uh, to the results, uh, we first look at uh, the impact of reducing tariffs uh, and NTMs on uh, uh, exports of uh, EREGs and, and uh, EPPs. Uh, we see that uh, tariff cuts on, on uh, EPPs are, uh, are actually almost twice as important as those on, on EREGs. Uh, we see that more countries actually benefit uh, from, so the, the upper uh, uh, chart here shows the impact on EREGs, and while this uh, chart here shows the impact on uh, EPPs, uh, we see that uh, uh, actually most countries uh, actually benefit or the, the exports of most countries actually increase as a result of the liberalization, which uh, somehow comes a little bit as a surprise. Uh, we uh, have not shown here uh, the fact that uh, that uh, global exports uh, tend to increase for all countries and for, for all uh, areas, uh, groups of countries and areas. Um, as a result of the, the liberalization. Turning now uh, to uh, uh, the, the macro effect, uh, we see that uh, the real GDP is projected to increase in, uh, all, in all regions um, with, a, with a fall, even those where there's a fall in real exports. Um, of uh, environment to, uh, uh, energy related environmental goods and EPPs. Um, actually, the reason why this is the case uh, uh, is threefold. Uh, we, we have identified, say, three channels uh, that drive this result. One is uh, the fact that the reduction in tariffs and NTMs reduces distortions in the economy, which uh, raises output. Uh, a second is that uh, uh, NTMs are actually modeled as modeled as uh, iceberg trade costs and resource wasting regulations because they are resource wasting often resource wasting regulations, which implies that uh, when we reduce them, uh, they operate like a, it operates like an increase in productivity. Uh, the, and, and lastly, the reduction in the price of uh, uh, energy efficiency and resource efficiency goods leads to an increase uh, in energy efficiency, which also constitutes a positive uh, productivity effect. Uh, here we uh, sort of uh, show this, the, the, the cumulative effect of the various uh, uh, scenarios. So the first uh, uh, is just the effect of uh, uh, a change in the, of the change in trade costs. Um, and, and this, uh, without, which is not surprising, actually raises uh, emissions uh, by a relatively small amount. Um, then we uh, 
combine, uh, well, actually we, we start, uh, um, the, the energy efficiency effect kicks in, and this one turns the projected uh, emission effects uh, negative. Uh, that's, that's a technique effect. Uh, and uh, then uh, the CR, the, 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 the clean and renewable energy effect uh, is a bit disappointing because uh, uh, without end use control, uh, it actually uh, slightly uh, reduces the, the reduction or sort of increases emissions. Um, and uh, with a, a, a very uh, with, with the end use control, it adds it, it's, it sort of increases a little bit the impact of uh, uh, the, the the liberalization of, uh, of of trade in environmental goods, and uh, uh, increases by a very small amount the uh, the the reduction uh, of uh, emissions achieved. Uh, we see that uh, the last column actually just shows that uh, uh, about half of this effect is uh, is related to to tariffs, while the other half is related to uh, to NTNs. Um, the uh, here we uh, show now the effect of uh, the 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 liberalization on uh, emissions, and we see that. Uh, uh, all almost all regions, uh, all regions, but to actually see a reduction in their emissions. Again, uh, it's not the super important given the nature of the of this externality, but uh, the global nature of the externality. But uh, so so where where it's where the where the emissions are reduced is is not uh, the most important. Thing, uh, the large, large variation, but there is a large variation in emission reductions between regions uh, because of uh, uh, a variation in estimated impact of uh, of uh, EE and RE trade on emissions, and uh, because of general equilibrium effects. Uh, we have uh, 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 we tried to find an explanation why uh, EFTA uh, EFTA's emissions actually increase, and it seems to be related to the fact that uh, to Norwegian uh, exports of uh, of electricity and the fact that they become uh, I mean the production of electricity becomes much more productive, but the productivity increases in in Norway more than elsewhere, and so demand increases, and that's that's part of the the reason, both for, for clean and, and for dirty, actually, uh, electricity. So let me conclude. Uh, uh, so we actually simulated the CO2 emission effects of trade liberalization in energy-related environmental goods and in environmentally preferable products, uh, considering three channels, a technique, a sort of technique effect, composition effect, and scale effect. Uh, we, are, we have three main findings. The first one is that uh, rising exports of uh, EREGs and EPPs in most regions uh, an increase, uh, uh, so, sorry, sorry, that there are rising exports of EREGs uh, and EPPs in most regions and an increase in aggregate exports in all regions. Uh, a modest increase in GDP in all regions as a result of uh, the falling tariff and NTMs and an improved uh, energy efficiency and a modest reduction in global emissions of about 0.6%. Uh, Since the effect uh, of lower prices of capital goods used in production of renewables is, is relatively small, uh, end use control is not important in, uh, in, in, uh, in our results, uh, which is uh, different from uh, what uh, who and, uh, and colleagues actually find. Uh, they found a, a bit of a stronger uh, impact uh, and this may be related to a number of differences uh, that are listed here. Uh, three uh, additional channels could be modeled. Actually, one of the channels has been explored in one of the papers that have already been uh, presented. Uh, it's uh, the, the first one, the, the technology spillovers and promotion of, of, of green innovation, which unfortunately uh, has turned out to be relatively disappointing. Um, and, and, and actually, uh, sort of that the reason why uh, we uh, sort of uh, uh, dug a little deeper on, on this is because uh, the effect of the of the liberalization of EPPs of uh, EREGs in, in, in this uh, in this paper are found to be relatively uh, small. And so we wanted to see whether uh, this was because we missed an important uh, effect and uh, doesn't seem to be the case, or at least 
may be related to, to the way we model it. Uh, the shift uh, to EVPs uh, reducing is reducing emissions. Of, we, we could look at how uh, the, a shift to EVPs actually reduces emission from production and consumption. But for this, we would need uh, data on uh, the, the sort of detailed data that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is doesn't seem to be available at this stage. Uh, and lastly, we could um, explore more detailed effects, uh, for example, through uh, better environmental monitoring or, or waste management. Um, but, uh, but again, that uh, would not necessarily, I mean, first, you would need to understand the link between uh, what happens to waste management and climate change, if this is what we're focusing on. Or we could also uh, look at uh, other uh, uh, change, change uh, sort of uh, environmental effects of the, of the, of this liberalization of environmental goods. Remember that the list of environmental goods doesn't only include most lists or in, in, in the discussions, for instance, in the context of the WTO, haven't necessarily focused on, on those goods that improve, uh, uh, that reduce emissions, but have been much more broadly uh, 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 considering uh, goods that could improve all sorts of environmental indicators. Thank you. Okay, questions for Mark. Um, I will say that uh, compared to previous assessments we've done of potential environmental goods agreements, this is really quite a step forward integrating both the changes in trade effects into mapping them back into uh, environmental and emissions effects. So kudos guys for extending that kind of work and focusing more on, not just on the trade effects, but also on the uh, potential environmental effects. Questions, please. Mark, you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah. I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Has anybody else looked at this particular Question. I know we did a few years ago when there was active negotiations um, on the environmental goods agreement, but anybody else been thinking about this particular question? Seems very relevant to the WTO. Well, Not seeing any questions, I'm going to assume that your uh, presentation was definitive. Um, uh, no, uh, no, sorry. Stephen, uh, Bob, hey, Stephen Bob. please. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think uh, the question you ask is whether other, anyone else is looking at this question. I've listened very carefully uh, to the presentation by Mark and Eddie. Uh, because yes, it's an it's an important issue at least here in the continent here here, here in Africa, um, and I was able to see that uh, it looks like uh, Africa is not doing so badly in terms of the in terms of the the status of um, uh, where we need to go from uh, once you start the start the liberalisation. Um, but it's an important issue. We haven't done work on in this area, but we are starting to do some work in this area. So the work that the WTO has done is going to form a good basis of where we start. Um, it's something we are going to do with CEPI um, probably before the end of this year, uh, leading into, into next year. So thank you for the presentation, but it's an important issue to us. Uh, but I have, no, I have no question, but I've taken notes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Good to hear and good to know that you guys are going to be doing that work collaboratively with CEPI. So we'll, yes. we'll pay attention and do keep in touch with, uh, with uh, the WTO team. So thanks. Mustafa, Absolutely. Mustafa, please. Yeah, no, Remember. thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, good to see you, Bob. And uh, uh, also to congratulate uh, all colleagues from, from research. Uh, in fact, I, I wanted to take the floor uh, to also mention what Stephen uh, also indicated, because just before leaving EC, I was also working with Steve on this issue. And uh, uh, also the question, uh, how to uh, define environmental goods uh, is something very important. Uh, and I know that UNIDO has developed a very interesting database to, to, to look at you know, green industry, uh, and also uh, how to uh, look at a very disaggregated level uh, 
and how to green trade agreements. For instance, in, in, in ECA uh, with, 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 with Stephen and, and Simon before, uh, we really look also at you know, the, the, the nature of the product and how the product would have some uh, spillover effect in terms of greening the trade agreements. So, so I just wanted to flag this aspect and to say also that there is very interesting databases uh, produced by uh, UNIDO uh, on, on this issue, which also help to understand the link between uh, uh, trade intermediate goods, intermediate goods, because I think it's very important when we look at regional and global value chains and how uh, trade agreements could also support uh, a green revolution and transform, you know, uh, 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 through positive incentives, uh, uh, the, the environment. I will stop here, but I think also the question of access to green finance is important and how to link also, you know, this initiative, not only from a punitive, you know, incentive, but also from a positive perspective, how to have access to green and innovative, you know, uh, 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 let's say like green bond or blue bond, you know, when we talk about ocean economy or blue economy, I think there's something also important to have in mind in terms of having access to innovative source of uh, financing for development, but also for economic transformation. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Mark and, and colleagues. Thanks, Mustafa, for that um, those comments and intervention. Um, let me then turn to Dominique. The floor is yours, Dominique. Yeah, so one of the things we're struggling with is, you know, what other technologies going to be in 2050 and beyond? So Mark is focused on technologies we know about, but, you know, think of hydrogen, for example. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, hot air on hydrogen right now, but, but there, there might be prospects there and there. You think that Africa, for example, could, could potentially be exporting a huge amount of hydrogen in the future, you know, could it harness, you know, the blue technologies, uh, is it blue or green? It's green, right? The green technologies, the wind, the, the, the wind and solar resources to convert, uh, to convert water into uh, hydrogen. So I think, uh, I, I think that's one of the things a lot of us modelers are struggling with is that we're kind of stuck with what we know, but, you know, we need to think, a little bit out of the box, uh, and what you know, what the potential is. Yeah, I'd reinforce that, and I think that's where looking at some speculative alternative scenarios are are interesting to help maybe give some some boundaries or some I don't know guide uh, some, some guideposts as to how the world might evolve, um, might influence policy. So I think that speculative work is. Uh, is useful as long as it's recognized as, as speculative. Um, one thing I, I, I also find CG models useful in this context is when you look at those speculative scenarios, the general equilibrium constraints on resources is very useful because uh, a lot of policymakers get speculative without resource constraints. And so magical things then happen. And I think it's uh, it's useful to at least constrain that speculative thinking based on some primary economic concepts. Um, any other questions or comments for our presenters? Not seeing any at this point. I would like to say thank you to the presenters. Congratulations on great papers. Um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if it's ironic, it's interesting. Uh, the last panel here that I'm, uh, I'm chairing or moderating uh, is uh, all WTO panel. And, uh, you know, this is uh, my last few weeks at the WTO. So it's a great pleasure to be able to, to moderate with a group of uh, my colleagues here and the great work they've been doing. So uh, thanks guys for making this uh, a wonderful ride for me and doing such great work to help inform policymakers and engaging with the rest of the policy community here around important uh, economic questions. So. Thank you all, and I wish you a great uh, whatever time it is where you are. So, Bob, you let all. me just add, I'm very impressed with what you and the team have done in the last few years. That's it's the been, team. It's the team. You've come um, a very long way, and, and you guys are, are really uh, dealing with some, some topical issues, but dealing with them very, uh, you know, in, in very comprehensive manner. So I'm, I'm very right. impressed. I will say this, uh, Director General Ngozi very much wants the WTO Secretariat generating useful information uh, 
knowledge and facts to help inform negotiations here, which is um, a bit of a change, I think, from um, the previous administration. And I think it's a, it's a useful change. We'll have to see if members uh, pick up on it or not. Um, there is debate among some of the members, but I think it has to do with comparative advantage. I think there are some colleagues here who contribute to certain members having a comparative advantage. Um, but uh, our, our job, like Stevens, I think, is to try to um, you know, level the playing field on knowledge and insights. So, uh, let, yeah. me, let me add to Dominique. So all the discussions of WTO reform and such, it, a lot of them would involve expanding the role of the secretariat. And I think the work you've done in the research department has been noticed in the sense that you'd like to expand the role of the research at the WTO and its role in the trade stuff. So I, I, I think that's been a very a major contribution, Bob. Well, thank you. Uh, it's my colleagues who have done it. I've just, uh, I've been trying to herd cats and they're good cats. So. <laughs> Well, it's a pretty good bunch of cats. It is. Indeed. It is. You, well, you sign you all. your checks, Bob. <laughs> I don't sign any checks. <laughs> I do go searching for resources, which that can be an adventure, like Candyland. All right. Well, thank you all, and um, you know, have a great afternoon and evening. Thanks. Bye.